Well, I guess I could, you know, categorize myself as a worrier in general. So yeah, there's lots of things I worry about, but I try not to. But you know, that's what music is for. You can, you can relieve all that worry through music. I'm Andy Laverne. Uh, I'm a jazz pianist, composer, arranger, author, educator, and uh, jack of all trades. Not really. <laughs> Both of my parents played piano, uh, but they played classical piano. I did start playing violin first because my sister was playing violin, so I wanted to play violin. But then I, my parents bought a, a really nice little Steinway baby grand, and uh, I was really drawn to that instrument. At the age of five, my parents enrolled me at Juilliard School of Music. And I was the youngest student in the history of Juilliard. Uh, but I was there for a long time, so that's where I received most of my training. Juilliard at that time did not have a jazz program until years and years later. So uh, maybe when I was in junior high school, uh, I was listening to the radio, and I came across a jazz station, and that's kind of what did it. I met Bill, uh, well, first of all, he was playing uh, at the Village Vanguard quite a bit at that point. I was really enamored by his music. I was just like, that's all I could think about was Bill Evans. This was when I was around 18, as soon as I was able to get into the Village Vanguard. Uh, and I would just go hear him every night. I had no intentions of, you know, trying to talk to him or anything. I mean, I, I, I was kind of a, a, a shy, you know, young man at that point. And, uh, I didn't have the courage to even think about trying to talk to him or anything. He was also very kind of introverted, just like I was. And after he played, he would just disappear backstage. You know, um, so he, he never fraternized with people in the audience. Or as, as a matter of fact, he never even announced anything. Uh, one night, he just happened to come off the stage and sit at, at a table right next to the table I was sitting at. And, you know, I, I was kind of freaked out just by that. But then I, I, I could hear his conversation. And so he was talking about he just, he just moved into a, a new apartment in Riverdale in the Bronx. And that's where I lived with my parents at the time. I just had to say something, you know, because that was just too much for me to keep to myself. So I went over to him and I said, excuse me, Mr. Evans. He was very friendly and uh, invited me to sit down and we talked for a while. And, uh, you know, I told him I played piano and he invited me over to his apartment. And that's, that was how the lessons started with Bill. And years later, I mean, we became friends also. He came to my, the first named gig that I had with Winnie Herman, Winnie Herman Big Band, um, around 1973. We played at the Plaza Hotel in New York, and Bill Evans shows up in the audience wearing a tuxedo. I, couldn't, I could never figure out what that was all about. But anyway, we, we, you know, we ended up talking. We took the elevator downstairs together. Over the years, I'd run into him on the road. And then when I was playing with um, Stan Getz Quartet, Bill and I got to hang out a lot because that whole tour was a combination of the Stan Getz Quartet and Bill Evans Trio. So we were traveling together every day. Nothing lasts forever, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I'm painfully aware of that. This is one of the one of the problems with getting older, you know. It's like a lot of my really close friends have passed away over the past several years. Most notably, John Abercrombie, who used to teach here at Purchase. John was one of the first close friends that passed away, and, and it's sort of been uh, like dominoes after that. Not to mention all my, almost all of my uh, musical idols have passed away, including my, my friend Chick Corea, who passed away, you know, just a couple of years ago, which was a big shock also. So uh, you just never know, but um, yeah, I mean, that's just the life cycle, I guess. You just gotta accept it. But uh, I mean, I have no intentions of stopping playing. My next project is the thing that I look forward to the most. I have a bunch of things brewing right now. And also I'm starting to already think about my next record, even though I have a record coming out in March. You know, as soon as I'm done with the project, it's on to the next project for me. So I don't really dwell on the previous project. Once that's put together, I don't go back generally to listen to those. You know, I realize that I've had a lot of experience and a lot of training, and I'm, you know, fairly confident uh, 
in that regard. But uh, I'm never satisfied with what I do. I always felt like I could play better. But after a while, you, you, you know, for me anyway, I started to realize that there's, a, you know, there's always something that I can do next. It's been like a series of opportunities that come up that, you, you know, you can't... The more planning I did, the less successful I was. I just had to kind of let it happen. Most people who are not musicians or not in the arts find it really difficult to relate to that lifestyle. I have a tune that I wrote years ago, and I remember when I was at a, uh, like a family gathering um, with some you know, more distant aunts and uncles. And they would say, well, what do, you, you know, what do you do? What do you do for a living? And say, you know, I play music, you know, I play piano. And at the end of the conversation, they would say something like, well, uh, good luck with your music. You know, like, kind of. So I wrote a tune called Good Luck With Your Music. Looking back on it, it's kind of astounding to me. But, you know, like when I played with Dizzy Gillespie or Sonny Stitt or, you know, Stan Getz, for instance, uh, or any of the people that I played with, it was just, you know, when it came time for me to do those gigs, I was more concerned about, you know, getting the music right and and just playing what I had to play, you know. So it wasn't really, you know, I, I didn't really think about it. You don't really think about it. You just play the gig. As a matter of fact, I, I, um, I did his, uh, his last gig for him. It, it was at a club called Fat Tuesdays in New York. Bill played Tuesday and Wednesday. And then I got a call from the club. And they said, Bill is sick. Uh, he wants you to come in and sub for him. You know, so I went. It turned out, the same thing happened every night until, you know, including Sunday. So Bill did Tuesday and Wednesday. I did Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Bill died on Monday. The last time I saw Bill was shortly before that. And I was playing a gig at uh, a club called Bradley's. And I look up and Bill is sitting at the bar. So after the set, he comes up and he gives me the, he was a big guy. He was like over six, well over six feet. Um, he gave me this bear hug and I thought he was gonna actually crush me. And uh, yeah, I remember that quite well. Take a little water here. Sure. You can edit this part out, I assume. <laughs>